Hello, hello, everybody. We're letting everybody come on through. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you so, so much for coming out. We're going to get everybody into our meeting and feel free. You can listen to this like a podcast if you want with your sound and video off, or you can have your video on whatever you feel like is most comfortable for today. But we're so excited to have you guys and super, super excited about the content that we're about to bring to today. So first and foremost, my name is Abby Griffith. I'm the owner and founder of Clarity Fitness, which is Georgia's first body positive fitness center. We're actually in the heart of downtown Decatur. And we are doing a Love Your Body Month celebration all month long with tons of amazing content and amazing events, one of which is this one that we have today. So today you are at five tips for fueling your body. No diets needed. This is an eating disorder, safe conversation, and it's not specifically for people who have eating disorders necessarily, but if you do identify that way, you will definitely get some tips and tricks as well as if you don't, you will also get some amazing content out of this session. So again, Clarity Fitness is Georgia's first body positive wellness center. We are a high-end boutique incredibly clean and COVID conscious facility that's trained in health at every size, eating disorder awareness and body positivity. I personally struggled with an eating disorder for much of my life. So it's a really big passion project of mine to bring a safe space that's free of diet culture and toxic relationships with fitness to the community so that people can explore wellness on their own terms and start getting encouraged about health instead of discouraged about the skin that they're in. So it's been amazing to really bring this community together. And again, so grateful for all of you guys that I'm seeing here that are already a part of the Clarity Fitness family. As for today, for today's event, um, I wanted to bring up some special events that we have coming up as well. So with this weekend coming up, Paige is actually going to be partnering with us and an in-person but still COVID conscious limited capacity event at 3 p.m. on Saturday at the Clarity Fitness Space. This is a mindful movement session. So we're going to be fueling ourselves. We're gonna be talking about mindful fueling as well as fueling for movement, fueling for sport, And we're gonna get a super all, all bodies, all everyone accepted and welcome movement session in that's going to be really amazing and just a really good time to explore what feels good in your own body. We also have over at Clarity Fitness Date Yourself Yoga Fest that's coming on Friday, February 26th at 5 p.m. That's going to be a really amazing space for us to all come together and just give ourselves some credit for what we've accomplished so far in the year for our innate worth that is already present no matter what. We're going to do some yoga. We're going to do some fun wine and chocolate as desired. And we actually are bringing on Connie from The Body Positive to do an interview with me that evening. It's going to be a really, really amazing session. And we're so excited to bring you guys some fun love to close out your February. We also want to give a massive shout out to Eden, which is one of our sponsors of today's event for giving us a space to have these conversations. We want to make sure that you are checking out their website at myeden.org to see what events are coming up for Love Your Body Month as well through their activities and through their amazing work. So we're super excited to be a part of that community too. Last but not least, I would love to introduce our amazing speaker of the day, Paige Love. She is a beyond incredible sports dietitian in the eating disorder space, and she is certified in sports nutrition. She has been a massive role model of me for months and years, and I'm so, so, so grateful that she has been such an amazing supporter of Clarity, as well as helping me learn a ton about eating disorder education and body positivity. I can't say enough amazing things about her. She's phenomenal, and we're so excited to have her. Without further ado, Paige, I'd love for you to take it away. Awesome. Did we need to let Marcy share anything? She said to just plug Eden, but Marcy, okay. if you want to share something. <laughs> well, <No. thanks>. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Um, and she kind of stole my storm in that I was going to also mention mindful fueling and movement, but I'll mention the, the other event that's happening tomorrow night, which is kind of a nice 
segue into my talk because I'm hoping all of you will come out of this feeling like you can more freely enjoy your food and fuel your body. And guess what? Desserts fit into that too. And tomorrow night is Dessert Club and we are going to a fun place that I've never been to, but I couldn't resist the name. It's called Cineholic. We're going to Cineholic, a cinnamon bun place in Dunwoody. And these are, um, it's going to be a mindful dessert outing to help you be able to first, number one, to face dessert fears, to realize that you can have a dessert in moderation. So we're going there to enjoy a dessert mindfully, taking your time. And I'll have a little bit of literature and process information for people who attend. It'll be more in written form. It's very informal, but this is also part of the Love Your Body Month activity. So we're, we're hoping you'll join us for that tomorrow night at seven at the Dunwoody Cineholic which leads me into five tips for fueling your body. Very excited about this uh, topic. And what I'm gonna really try to do is help you feel more comfortable with more freely giving your body what it needs nutritionally, hopefully with the result of helping you learn how to raise your metabolism, improve your energy, hopefully negating the diet mentality that a lot of you may be entering this session with. Most people in our culture do have that. And so by the end, I hope you will have learned some key fueling tips. I hope you'll come away with five tips that you can immediately try to integrate into your own eating plan and, and which will hopefully help you better fuel your movement plan, but also have a better handle on some of the fallacies with the bad diet uh, industry and some of the types of approaches out there that so many of you probably have tried and found that they don't work for you. And we're gonna kind of debunk those along the way. So I'm gonna jump in. And first thing I just wanna introduce, and I've already said the terminology is diet mentality. Um, when I, as a dietitian, have clients come into my first session, I'm often finding that they come in with the idea that they're that I'm even going to tell them, here's food you should have, here's food you should avoid, um, here's the good foods, here's the bad foods. That's what we call diet mentality. And we know that that does not work in the long term to help people with a lifestyle supportive, uh, healthy eating plan, because you start feeling badly if you've eaten one of those things on your bad list, you start restricting or overcompensating with exercise. And then this kind of takes you down a rabbit hole, which often can lead into disordered eating or maybe full-blown eating disorders. Um, no question why we have this. Our culture is very focused on this. This is a good example in an ad. Um, I'm sure a lot of you notice this in the magazines and even on TV, different kinds of ads that you see that promote um, you know, certain things being bad and, and certain things being good. And the, the current trend and has been for the last, I'd say 20 years actually, has been this high protein, low carb trend, which I'm really going to uh, try to debunk today and help you feel more comfortable with allowing adequate carb energy in your diet. So also um, borrowing this from uh, moving a, a program called Moving Away from Diets that a group of dietitians uh, that I have worked with for years developed the diet versus non-diet paradigm and, and really just kind of defining that diet mentality a little bit further versus a non-diet mentality that I'm hoping a lot of you are working on and will hopefully come out of this today being open to. And that is where rather than having foods that are characterized as good or bad or should or shouldn't have, that you will neutralize foods, that all foods can be a part of your eating plan. All foods can provide energy into your diet, uh, that you will learn to determine how much you need by listening to your body by tuning into your body with your, your movement, um, your hunger cravings. And, and with the diet mentality, everything is very externalized. Here's the list, here's what you should do. Don't listen to your body, do things to suppress your hunger. Um, don't eat when you're hungry. We're really going to the other side of the coin, which may be foreign territory for some of you. Um, so just try to take it in and, and see what you think. But the main thing is starting to honor your body and not deny your hunger. So I've got a few screening questions. These are often things that I will ask in an initial session, um, just to kind of check in with people on where they are with their uh, overall uh, ideas on fueling and, and eating. 
Um, I ask about where the foods are proportionally on the plate. I even encourage people to consider pictured food journals to monitor themselves because it's much less obsessive and it allows, if you have somebody that's working with you like a dietitian, it allows them to see the proportions that helps you not to get crazy with measuring and calories and macros. Um, so really kind of moving away from that. Um, as I've already mentioned, there's been a trend for the last couple of decades for avoiding carbs to better manage our weight, and we're going to debunk that today. Those are our essential fuels. Um, a lot of people also go on extreme diets that are high protein that cause them to be very dehydrated, so it's critical that you are adequately hydrating and, and our muscles are 80% water. We definitely need to be putting those fluids into our body on a very regular basis, regular intervals throughout the day. We wanna fuel up first thing in the day. Um, I see so many people every day that just are not eating much for breakfast. So you're, you're starting the day off on empty. So this is gonna be one of the fueling takeaways that you do get a fuel source in, in the morning and a fuel source would be an energy source. And we're gonna talk about what those two sources will be as we proceed through the presentation. Um, are you skipping meals? If you're skipping meals, you're, you're missing opportunities to fuel your body. Um, how frequently are you eating? I recommend generally minimally four times a day up to seven times a day. So eating uh, three meals, one, two, four snacks, pending your training level. And I work with a lot of um, recreational and elite athletes who have multiple training sessions appropriately, and they really need to learn how to do pre and post snacks before and after their uh, training sessions or exercise sessions. I know we have personal trainers on the call today and you all are working out all day with your client. Um, you need to be fueling before and after even your workout sessions with your clients, even if it's not your own intensive workout. Um, so how evenly are you spreading out your food, food throughout the day? How, how even are your meals spread throughout the day? It's recommended that most of us eat about every three to four hours. So between meals and snacks, are you fueling yourself in regular intervals? That would be another really important takeaway for today, a fueling tip that you don't go longer than four hours with an energy source coming in. And are you missing any major energy sources? So I'll stop for a moment here and say the main energy sources are carbohydrates and healthy oils. Those are energy sources. Protein is meant to be, which is the third macronutrient, more of a building block nutrient. It's really not the preferred energy source. So with all these high protein diets, we're forcing our body to use protein as a fuel and that's a very inefficient process and, and we end up throwing the body out of balance when we do that. Um, how often are you snacking? Um, if you have a longer than normal interval between meals, do you allow an energy snack to help you? Um, I have snacks in my office when clients come in and they tell me they haven't eaten for a while, I offer a snack right in that moment. Um, so not being afraid to fuel yourself uh, in maybe unusual intervals. If you're, nobody has an exact schedule, I mean, some of us do, but most people's schedules get thrown off a little bit. So if your schedule gets thrown off and your meal time gets pushed out, don't be afraid to have another snack, throw that energy source into the day. And then do you have a pre and post movement fueling plan? Um, this is critical. And, and I find particularly for younger Athletes that I work with are active people. They have no idea what this is. They haven't even thought about it. They might have a snack, but they aren't really thinking in terms of energy sources and uh, fueling appropriately with, for example, carbohydrates before they exercise and then a protein and recovery. So these are just some things to kind of be pondering as I go through the slides. I wanna start off though, with just kind of debunking some of the really popular diets. Um, that I've been exposed to as a sport dietitian over the years. So from fasting to very super low calorie intakes to one food group diets to food combining, like you should eat certain foods together and you shouldn't eat other foods together to the low carb, high protein, which has really been the predominant diet focus in the last couple of decades to the weight loss drinks bar, packaged meal programs um, that are out there that are also super low calorie. These are some of the popular things that people will do this time of year to, to jump on a bandwagon to change their uh, body composition. Um, these are some names of some of these types of diets. I'm sure you've heard of a lot of these. Um, I've been exposed to most of these during my career. What I try to get my clients aware of is how to recognize when something's a fat. 
Um, does it promote really rapid weight loss, losing an unusual fast amount of weight in a very short time period or losing a certain number of inches in a very short time period? Is it all packaged foods and no exercise or is it lots of excessive exercise and a very low calorie intake? Does it have this diet mentality, the good versus bad foods? Does it promise a quick fix? Are the recommendations, if they even have any research to support it based on the company that's selling the product and on very limited studies, like maybe a single study that was really not published in any well-known uh, journal that would be considered a peer-reviewed journal, like for example, British Journal of Medicine or um, you know, our, our academy journal, um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics journal. So something that's well-known, I know we have professionals on the call, each of our professional areas has its own refereed peer-reviewed journal. And typically studies take several years, just as we saw the accelerated vaccine studies even took a while and our vaccines are being delayed because of it took a while to make sure these things were working for us. Same thing with diets. Do these diets really work? A lot of diets are published and out there and people are on them before we know if they're even safe for them to be on them. Bottom line, if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Um, again, there's no magic bullet out there. If there was, dietitians wouldn't be in business. <laughs> and so here we are trying to help people on the back end of trying a lot of these fad diets. Why diets don't work? The average diet only lasts about 42 days. And as you, as you kind of even think back through your dieting history, uh, most people have, you know, are all excited for the first couple of weeks, probably get through that first month, generally going into about a month and a half, most people start falling off and they start finding that these one food diets or packaged food programs or very extreme low calorie levels are not sustainable. So if a diet is not sustainable and you can't last on it and it's not meeting your energy needs and you're finding that you're starting to fall into other unhealthy behaviors and cravings, like maybe you're falling into some extreme uh, sugar cravings at night and even binge eating when you're on a diet like this, some of these diets actually set the stage for eating disorder behavior. And again, you know, is there any real data, peer reviewed data to support that this extreme diet approach is safe or will work? So I'm gonna get into just a little bit of the basic science and physiology. And, and what I like to point out, and I review this in a first session with a client is, what kind of physical symptoms are you having, period? And are any of these related to possibly not getting enough fuel, particularly in your key macro areas? Uh, that provide energy like carbohydrate and protein and fat. So hypoglycemia, most commonly caused from not eating often enough, definitely not eating enough calories and carbohydrate. Losing muscle mass, also from not eating enough energy, but could also be from not eating enough protein. Loss of bone density, we don't think of that as something that could be affected by this, but so extremely low calorie levels, low fat intake, starts to suppress our hormone production, decrease our hormone reservoir that starts to affect our bone density. A lot of uh, exercising people who are dieting will notice that the first sign of this is they'll lose a period and then possibly be at risk for a stress fracture. I see this a lot with cross country runners I work with. Heat illness, we don't think about that being as much related to energy, but low energy sets the stage for muscle fatigue. High protein, low carbohydrate sets the stage for loss of fluids out of the muscle. Um, I also see a lot of people, and I'm only going to mention this here, um, suppressing their appetite with high caffeine intake or caffeine pills or diet pills, and, and this sets the stage for dehydration and loss of, of fluids because you increase the rate that your body urinates fluid out. And just overall fatigue, I would say the number one complaint I get from clients coming to my door is fatigue. They just feel tired. And this often is related to not taking in enough carbohydrate and or total energy uh, caloric intake. And this little chart, it may be hard to see. And if anybody wants um, any of these slides afterwards, let me know. But um, this, I, I do have a few things about eating disorders throughout the presentation since we're being sponsored by Eden. And this is a slide showing how anorexia affects the body. And I'll sometimes show this uh, in a poster form to my clients and they'll often be able to kind of more quickly see, oh, I've struggled with this or that. And you know, different things I don't have it mentioned here, but loss of muscle mass would also be loss of organ mass. And when you're not eating enough energy, your heart starts to decrease in size, your brain starts to decrease in size. And this is a chronic 
deficit that would start to cause this. So these are things that we're really concerned about. And this can even be happen happening in a low grade way to someone that doesn't even have a full-blown eating disorder. So what about fueling? How do we best meet our energy needs to fuel? The key areas are the carbohydrate food groups, which, which often get uh, slammed on these high protein, low carbohydrate diets and decreased or eliminated. So we need more grains. We need more fruits. Those are our main carbohydrate forms in the diet. We still, we do need adequate protein, but again, protein is not our our energy source, it's our building block food. I like to say it's the building block of everything we physically see in each other, the, you know, the external, the skin, the hair, the eyeballs, but also inside the muscles uh, and the bones. So whether it be meat, meat alternative or dairy, these are the building block foods and obviously essential uh, to help keep our body intact. But we also need, and this is sometimes a scary area, small amounts of uh, vegetable and animal fat. These are backup energy sources. So they actually fuel the longer lasting activities, those longer lasting jobs that people have. You know, if you're on your feet all day, let's say you're in a medical profession or you're, you know, working in a grocery store and you're standing at a checkout area. I have had clients in both of these kind of realms all day long. They're standing. Your energy needs are so much higher. You're going to need more carb and more fat to support that long work day to fully meet your energy needs. And then hydration, we don't think of it as an energy source, but some of our hydration sources may be food group beverages, maybe dairy, maybe fruit juice, maybe a smoothie. So it's going to be an energy source as well. And of course we want these to be decaffeinated options, not caffeinated options to help support our hydration needs. And then as I'm working with active people, I, I really like my clients to be open to the idea of supplemental nutrition in the form of sport foods. Um, most people know what an energy bar is, um, but they get confused on how to use them. Should I use a high protein bar? Should I use um, a macro type bar? Should I use a, a high carb bar? It really depends on how you're using the bar. And so understanding how to use the bars, for example, high carb bars are great, like a traditional cliff bar, or a, there's a new one I really like called pro bar. These are better for before activity. They're almost like a bagel in a bar if you want to give it a comparison. So if you have a run or a really intensive CrossFit workout, you're going to need something like that before your exercise session. Many active people also, particularly if you're exercising out in the heat, even if it's walking in the Atlanta summer heat, you're going to need something like a sport beverage that gives you energy and electrolytes. Uh, if you don't like a sport beverage, um, maybe a chew and an energy chew might be something that you could do that would give you a little bit of energy, a little bit of electrolytes. But if you don't like the idea of drinking the calories, maybe a small energy chew like a gummy along with your water could be a way to help meet those additional energy needs. So fueling is really about all of these areas. Um, the, the big focal point today will be carbohydrate adequacy, adequacy because this is the area that so many people cut back on when they're dieting or when they're following a fad diet, you'll almost classically see that carbohydrates are restricted to an extreme on, on most fad diets. So I'll have a lot of focus on understanding what your body's carbohydrate needs are as we go through the presentation. And I'm not going to do a lot on numbers, but I did want to have this one slide that kind of talked about really that last bullet that most people need 50 to 60% of the energy coming from carbohydrate in their diet, which is the complete flip opposite of these high protein, low carb diets. So this is coming from grains, fruits. And then I didn't mention dairy has a small carbohydrate component, lactose. Vegetables have a, a small carbohydrate component, it's just not as dense. So we actually have four of our food groups providing carbohydrates. So if you think about it, out of the six food groups, the two remaining are meat and oils or protein and oils. Those don't contain carbohydrate. So four of our six food groups are given us carbohydrates. So it would make sense that 50 to 60% of our energy intake, if you're eating adequately, would come from those areas or the food groups are going to give us carbohydrate. A, a very basic goal, if we're looking at you know, a macro count, because I know some of you are coming into this with that, and I don't mind providing this so you have factual information. Most active people need a minimum, minimum of three grams of carbohydrate per pound. And I have some athletes, and I'll show you in an upcoming slide, that will need even upwards of 12 grams of carbohydrate per pound of body weight. So it can be quite, quite high, depending what kind of endurance training you're doing. My whole focus with clients and, and consumers is, 
why not focus on what we need, not what we don't? So many of us focus on what we don't, and that's a myth in itself because we really can have all the foods that are out there. We need some in greater proportions and some in lesser proportions. So what's so bad about bread and pasta? Nothing. These are great energy sources. If you want to have these in a whole grain form, that's probably going to be a longer lasting energy form. But I'll, I'll share one of the, I think, most common sport nutrition fallacies out there for most people who are really active that are going into an intense active session, a lower fiber carbohydrate source like a white pasta or white bread is actually more desirable in the meal right before you're going to exercise. And I'll share a, an example that I think will be very vivid for you. If you're a runner or a crossfitter and you're going to have a morning exercise session and you're trying to fuel well, and let's say you say, okay, I'm going to have a cereal. What happens if you have a bowl of fiber one before you go into your morning exercise session? How is that going to feel in your body, that high fiber carb? This is an extreme. I think most of us are like, eh, no, that, that wouldn't feel good. That's going to be kind of moving through my digestive tract. Those are meant for regularity. That's going to be too much fiber. So high fiber things are actually tougher to digest, create more bloating and, and movement in the GI tract. So they're not desirable in the last meal before we exercise. In the overall diet, yes, we want high fiber foods. I'm not at all saying we don't want high fiber foods. But this, this um, idea that we shouldn't have any white flour and that we should avoid pasta and bread is truly a myth. These, these foods can fit into our eating plan. They're very enjoyable foods. And yes, it's fine to choose whole grain options outside of that, that pre-exercise time, um, but there's nothing wrong with occasionally having a white pasta or white bread. So this is just a good overall slide with kind of practical um, reminders of volumes. We often talk about carbohydrates, dietitians who work with disordered eating and fist amount. A fist is a cup. Most of you, even if you're inactive, need no less than three cups a day of your your, what I call your complex carbohydrates. So that's going to be those starchy foods, grainy foods. So it might be a bowl of cereal in the morning. It might be two slices of sandwich bread. It might be a cup of pasta. That's your three cups, just to give you a practical example. But some active people will need upwards of 10 cups a day. This might blow your mind, but I even have some uh, eating store clients I see who are athletes who are in that range. So we're really looking sometimes for the active person needing closer to two cups at a meal and the endurance athlete needing closer to three cups at a meal. Um, the things I've listed on the left of the slide, pasta, rice, potatoes, starchy vegetables, legumes, lentils, breads and rolls, these are the complex carbohydrates. Don't forget about your starchy vegetables being good forms of these. One I don't have on here that's common is also um, butternut squash, pumpkin, that would also fit in this realm. And when, when I have clients that are afraid to eat these carbs, I like to remind them of the function. Why do we need these carbs? Not only is it a primary energy source, again, another huge takeaway for today, but it stabilizes your blood sugar. It helps prevent going into that hypoglycemia, shaky low blood sugar level. Um, it's a source of fiber. So again, the fibrous carbohydrates do help promote regularity. If you have constipation, a very common cause of this is not enough complex carbohydrate and fiber in the diet. The surefire way to, to get yourself constipated is to try a high protein, low carbohydrate diet. Uh, these fibrous carbs are important sources of B vitamins. B vitamins are known as our energy vitamins. So these are critical to help meet those needs. Uh, also uh, fortified uh, sources of iron, cereals and breads and pastas, all are great sources of fortified iron. A lot of active people burn through more iron stores. They need higher levels of iron. These fortified sources are a great way to get these in. When you're eating adequate carbohydrate, you're actually raising your metabolism. When you're not eating enough carbohydrate, it's like you're siphoning gas out of the gas tank, you are lowering the metabolism. And most of my clients who come in the door want to know how to raise their metabolism. So if you want to raise your metabolism, don't deny your body its core energy source, complex carbohydrate. And then all this gluten sensitivity, gluten-free stuff, I just had to get a slide in there on that because that's still the craze. And I would say two or three clients a day come in my door thinking they need to avoid gluten without adequate real allergy testing to support that they need to. They just feel better on less gluten. Well, what I commonly find, my second bullet item there, along with not very many Americans truly have gluten sensitivity, 
is that when people cut back on gluten, they cut back on carb. It's just another more culturally acceptable way to cut back on carb. Now, the things I have pictured here, I am fully in support of someone that truly has gluten sensitivity and obviously celiac disease choosing an alternative form. It's will you let yourself choose that alternative form? So this is where we kind of kind of dance the fine line between am I doing this because I have real sensitivity or am I doing this because I'm afraid of carbohydrate and it's just another way to cut the carbs out. So we've got lots of great gluten-free options out there. If you really have gluten sensitivity, um, the Vans gluten-free waffles, the Glutino pretzels, Snyder's also has gluten-free pretzels, the Bonza chickpea pasta, the Udi's pizza crust and bagels and breads, Rudy's bagels and breads, the Crunchmaster crackers, which are so popular. These are just a few popular items. So it is very easy to meet your nutritional needs if you're open to the gluten-free alternative. And it doesn't even have to be a packaged processed thing. If we go back to my other slide on carb needs, rice, potatoes, peas, corn, legumes, lentils, these are all naturally gluten-free. So if you are going on a lower gluten diet and you're not allowing these natural gluten-free sources, then you really want to explore, are you afraid of carbohydrate? Are you not willing to give your body the fuels that it needs? So a few other things to be aware of with these very popular, you know, high protein, low carb diets that have really been the craze in the last, I'd say decade, the ones that I've pictured here, um, key things are low carbohydrate, usually low gluten, typically low sugar, but because they are low in energy, low in carbohydrate energy, our main energy source in the diet, your muscles will be fatigued. Your muscles will start to break down. I've already mentioned you'll slow your metabolism down. Glucose, the main fuel for the brain, starts to cause you to have trouble concentrating and focusing. And we have all these people with focus problems. How many of these people are not eating enough carbohydrate and, and not getting enough glucose to their brain? Um, you're not able to work out at, at the high intensity. You're getting tired in workouts if you're a high school or elite athlete. If you're not getting in the carbohydrates, the muscles are starting to become uh, dehydrated. You're burning up muscle glycogen. You're losing water. Um, so it's another increased risk for dehydration. As the muscle is breaking down and becoming dehydrated, you're increasing your risk for injury, muscle injury. Um, not to mention other injuries as your motor coordination starts to be affected by a weakened muscle state. Um, you're setting the strange stage for undernutrition. And because I see so many pediatric athletes stunting growth, lack of adequate energy starts to stunt growth. Even if you're eating adequate protein, you can still stunt growth without adequate energy. A few other things to keep in mind if you're not eating enough carbohydrate energy the low fiber can cause things like constipation, can make you more prone to bloating when you do occasionally have high carbohydrate foods. You're not getting in all the antioxidants like you need, for example, like vitamin C that would be uh, mostly coming from our fruit supply, which is also eliminated on the high protein, low carb diet. The high protein part of the diets is really stressful to the kidneys, causing you to urinate out a lot of fluid and overworking the kidneys in that, pro in that process of digesting and helping to break down the byproducts of protein. Along with the high intakes of animal fat or animal protein that are recommended on the high protein diets, you're getting a lot of animal fat. I just had somebody in the other day that had followed one of these with some fitness modeling competitions that this person was doing. And they were on this for actually over a year and they ended up with an elevated lipid profile, a really high cholesterol, high triglyceride, uh, level after being on one of these diets for a, a chronic long period of time. Another long-term side effect of high protein diets is they start to negate bone density, you start weakening the bone. I've also had clients who've had stress fractures after being on high protein, low carbohydrate diets. So as you under fuel energy, the body starts to break down back to the nutritional links that you saw earlier in my presentation. And then healthy oils. I like to use this analogy um, you know, it's, it's like I said, carbs is your gas, oils are your, fats are your oil to the car engine. It's going to help your body run smoothly. It's going to help your body fine tune that hormonal regulation of your body really comes from getting enough healthy fat. And I love to find food ads, as you saw with the previous uh, running with the grain ad, uh, when it relates to eating more adequately. And this is a great one. As it happens, I have an extra gear and it runs on peanut butter. 
Um, good thing is a lot of my clients like peanut butter. It's a wonderful, healthy oil. It, it helps with um, your energy lasting longer. It's a great uh, little thing to put a dab of on a grain uh, or a pre-exercise choice. And obviously the origin of peanut butter is nuts. So nuts would be right in there with the peanut butter. So not being afraid to give your body a little bit of these healthy oils. It just takes a little bit. I like to say a dab at each meal. Um, you'll hear some dietitians say a thumb. We want one or two thumbs at minimum. Most of us to maintain our weight need about two or three thumbs. So it'd be like having a couple tablespoons of salad dressing or half of an avocado at a meal or two tablespoons of nut butter on a bagel at breakfast. Um, oil-based condiments, even light condiments versus fat-free. I'm not encouraging light, but if you're so afraid to have a fat, but you're willing to try a light salad dressing first or a light cream cheese first, go for it. That's giving you a little bit and then hopefully you graduate to the normal fat content to give your body what it fully needs. Uh, don't be afraid to have a dip with your vegetables to give yourself a little bit of, of healthy fat. So just two to three teaspoons per meal. It's not much. If you're cooking with oil, you don't even see it. So it's cooking right into the food. Don't forget to fuel up with your breakfast. This is your key time. You're breaking the evening, the night fast with fuel, with energy, fiber. This is a great place to get it. Knock out a dairy, get a little bit of dairy protein, get a vitamin C source with your fruit, um, a little bit of additional protein, maybe with eggs or breakfast meat. It could be a wonderful well-rounded meal like you see here, a, a nice little breakfast spread. So if you struggle with breakfast, this is an area to just start adding small things. I'd start with your carbohydrate first, your, your complex carb. Could you have half a bagel? Could you have an energy bar? I have a lot of people start with energy bars there, like the Cliff Bars. Um, and then the next thing to add in would maybe be a dairy. So building your breakfast up, it's going to turn your metabolism on. It's going to rev your energy up. It's gonna help increase your, your fuel base for the day and, and honestly help you not feel as fatigued. And for those of you who chronically struggle with breakfast and really wanna work on this, I'll put another plug in for our Love, you Bo Love Your Body Month activity next week. I host a monthly breakfast club, but it's gonna be a part of our Love Your Body Month activities. And we're gonna meet at Jay Christopher's Saturday the 27th at nine for a breakfast. Um, so we offer these free meal supports during Love Your Body Month to give you a flavor of different ways you can work on this. And I offer these on a monthly basis. So you can come on the 27th or go to my website to find out when we do these in, uh, in following months in the future. But I go to a different restaurant every month and I'm there to just informally help you at whatever level you need support. The main thing is that you know you're going to come in, and the goal is to have something for breakfast. And you can work on whatever area you're working on, getting a complex carbohydrate, getting a protein source, or getting better balance in general in your meal. So don't forget that breakfast meal. Try to develop a pre and post exercise fueling plan. I think a lot of you who might have joined today because of Abby's um, connection and obviously her fitness studio, you may be exercisers. You, you need to have a fueling plan if you're an exerciser. You need a carbohydrate source about three to four hours before we exercise. That could be a part of a meal. That could be the sandwich bread. That could be um, the pasta or the rice. I do a lot of work with professional tennis and the top meal for tennis players in this three to four hour interval before they play, particularly if they have a midday or later in the day uh, match is pasta. Whether it be gluten-free or regular pasta, they're eating pasta and then second in line is rice. So those are kind of the two key complex carbohydrates that most active people naturally kind of think of as a base of their meal. So don't be afraid to have that, at least a cup of that at a meal and even upwards of two cups. And then we want to have a carbohydrate snack one hour before activity. And that's where maybe a granola bar fits in or a trail mix or some pretzels. It doesn't have to be much. You're really only talking about a half a fist at that time if you're just doing moderate activity. Um, and it's just really to kind of cap off your blood sugar, make sure you're not going into the exercise session with low energy. This weekend, um, the event that Abby and I are hosting is a mindful fueling and movement activity session. Fueling is in the title. I'm going to have free exercise snacks there for you to try. If you've not been in the habit of letting yourself take in a fuel source before you exercise, this is going to be another opportunity to try this in real time. Um, how many times have you shown up to an exercise session or an exercise class and not had a snack 
or not had anything to eat for multiple hours before you get there and thinking, oh, I'm going to burn off my calories from the day. You show up to these exercise classes and sessions without fuel in your belly, you're not burning as much energy and you're only breaking down muscle. So we're going to practice this in real time. I'm going to have some really safe, easy things to try in individual portions. And we're also going to have carbohydrate electrolyte fluids. Don't be afraid to have a sport beverage, even a lighter sport beverage or water in a sport beverage and having a sip of each to help you hydrate, to help you get in electrolytes and even energy. And again, some higher intensity activity sessions really need the energy coming in. If you're performing to win, energy coming in helps energy output maintain at its highest peak level. And if you're an athlete, that's critical. Um, if you're just exercising for fun, you might not be as concerned about that, but we all wanna feel better and feel like we're getting the most out of our exercise session. So don't be afraid to take an energy during an activity session. So fueling before, during, and then after, we still need a little bit of carb. Again, we've just burned a lot of energy and probably haven't fully met our energy needs. So we wanna cap off at the back end with a carbohydrate, but it can be part of a recovery beverage. For example, chocolate milk is kind of my number one thing to recommend. It's got that lactose, it's got protein, it's a liquid, it's hydrating, it's got a little bit of salt, a little bit of potassium. Couldn't find a more well-rounded beverage than that. And most of the protein drinks that are out there are, are built on an example of chocolate milk being the base. And many of them are higher protein than you need. Most women need about 10 to 15 grams of protein following an activity session. If you're a heavy exerciser, maybe 15 to 25 grams of protein. Um, that can be met, um, the, the 10 grams can be met with 12 ounces of chocolate milk, no problem. I also like the Fairlife chocolate milk line and they also um, have other higher protein shakes uh, because it's a lactose free and it's coming from a natural cow's milk uh, base. So think about getting in a quick protein source um, even if you're coming home after school, um, after a sport activity, or if I have some moms on this webinar today and have kids in sports, don't be afraid to encourage your kid to have a glass of milk as they're walking in the door, coming home from their sport activity. Even if it's going into dinner time, let them continue to finish drinking that. And it can be regular milk, doesn't have to be chocolate milk. Continue drinking that milk as they are going into their dinner meal. If there's an ideal window of time, and we really want that anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes after activity. We want that protein coming in during that time for recovery. All right, and then just our mindset. So I'm throwing out a lot of ideas today on things to think about doing, but it might sound scary. You might be afraid to increase the carbohydrate in your diet. You might be afraid the carbohydrates are gonna make you gain weight or gain fat. And so I, I like, to write in real time when a client says something like this or someone shares that they have this fear that these carbohydrates are fuels and it helps to turn your metabolism on. I call it reframing. This is um, well known by the therapists who might be joining us today. Um, they do it a lot with critical thinking. I do it with critical food thoughts. Um, what if it's just about increasing your food in general and you're afraid of weight gain? Well, no one food causes instantaneous weight gain. It's normal for the body's weight to fluctuate from day-to-day -day basis, mostly from fluid. Um, and don't forget, in the last little example, if, if you feel like you've gained a little bit of weight right after a meal, well, there's food in there. There's food in the tummy. It weighs something. There's liquid that you just consumed. It weighs something. It's pushing your, your abdominal area out a little bit. Three, four hours down the road, that has totally gone away because the food has moved further down the digestive tract. This is transitional, and it will go away. Uh, in fact, how we all wake up in the morning is a very good example. We've really been fasting all night because we were sleeping and when we're asleep, we're not eating. So you're waking up with that flatter tummy. That's really the way our tummy really is. Don't be critical of your tummy after eating because that's normal for the tummy to poke out a little bit. We have space in there for the food to be in there and be poking out a tad. And then just general snack choices that are good energy sources that we've already talked about uh, chocolate milk, um, nut butters, and even better, if you can combine a carbohydrate and protein together, it stabilizes your energy over a longer period of time. So the nut butter on crackers, granola with milk or yogurt, cottage cheese with tortilla chips, trail mix that has fruit and nuts and granola, fruited yogurt or kefir, because the dairies by themselves have lactose and have the dairy protein. 
cheese and crackers, sport bars that already contain uh, the protein in them. So there's lots of, of great snacks out there. Don't be afraid to explore some of these as you're trying to develop your fueling routine or you're, you're eating more frequently um, for better fueling yourself throughout the day. Some of you have really active days and jobs. You may need to bring a cooler full of your food and snacks for the day. Um, I help a lot of people develop their fueling plan for the day and um, even outlining kind of how that's all going to fit into the day and you have to decide, okay, what do I have access to at my job or at school and what do I need to bring? And usually it means you need to bring a lot of snacks to help you fully meet your needs. Try not to suppress your hunger with a lot of low calorie fillers. I have so many clients that tell me when they eat carbs, they feel bloated, but then when I really explore what they're eating, they're eating very little grainy carbs, but they're eating a ton of vegetables. Vegetables cause bloating before anything else, and that's causing most of your uncomfortable fullness. So if you're trying to make the shift from low carb to building up your carbohydrate, do it gradually, but back off of those excessive vegetables. Number one, those aren't giving you much energy, and the amount you might be consuming, like this ad kind of, it's kind of funny, but I have clients that are eating this many vegetables in a day. That's probably where your bloating is coming from. So if you back off of the veggies to make room for the grain, to make room for the complex carbohydrate, that transition will go a lot more smoothly and with, with a lot less bloating. And the salad phenomena. Um, how many of you love a salad with your grilled chicken or your salmon on it, but don't ever think to add a grain? Well, women, According to this book ad, we don't live by salad alone. No, we do not. A salad alone is not a meal. It is not a balanced meal if we're just talking lettuce. And if you're getting the meat on it, we're only halfway there. You need to get that carb energy source in there too. And luckily, the trend in the restaurant industry is with all these bowl meals. So you'll notice all the bowl meal places have those complex carb options there. Take advantage of that. Look for the salads on the menu that have garbanzo beans or black beans or corn or add a baked potato side to your salad. Don't be afraid to make a meal out of a salad. A salad alone, all that excess vegetable bulk is not going to help you. It's not going to give you much energy. And don't be afraid to have a little bit of healthy oil on there too, to help us meet those essential fat needs. And that might be a salad dressing, that might be nuts, that might be avocado. Um, so a well-balanced salad meal will have all of these components. And then it's a meal. And what you're really looking at is probably more like a bowl meal and, and having even components of the grain, the vegetable, and the protein. Really about a cup of each is what's recommended. And that would give you about four ounces of protein, a cup of veggies, which wouldn't be excessive, and then a cup of carb being that minimum carb. And that's really what we're looking at for a balanced salad meal. If you are somebody that hasn't been eating much carb, it is a little bit uncomfortable when you first introduce healthy carb back into your diet, these grainy, starchy carbs. I like to make the analogy, our, our intestinal tract, particularly the small and large intestine, it's a muscle and you let that muscle get deconditioned when you weren't eating adequate carbohydrate and it's weaker. We need to train that, that gut muscle to get used to ha handling an adequate amount of carb again. As you introduce these fibers and starches back into the diet, it's probably gonna be a two to four week adjustment time to get your body used to having more adequate carb in your gut. You're retraining the gut muscle. It's gonna be uncomfortable, just like a muscle sore after lifting weights when you haven't lifted weights in a while. Food is the weights, it makes the gut muscle sore, but the more consistent you are on that carbohydrate intake, the gut starts to get stronger and be able to handle that more normal level of carbohydrate. And you no longer have the discomfort, uncomfortable fullness and bloating. It's about a month in full for most people who've been on extremely low carbohydrate diets. And then it's, it's magical. People say, yeah, it doesn't bother me anymore. You know, I, I'm, I'm used to it. I, this, this amount seems very comfortable. So if you stick with it and slowly build up, you can retrain your body to handle the carbs without feeling overwhelmed in the gut. And at, when you're slowly building in the smarter approach if you're afraid of gaining weight too quickly obviously going with more whole grain options evenly spreading your carbs throughout the day another common mistake mistake people will make is they'll they'll backload and do too much at the end of the day and that can be overwhelming to the gut as we're getting ready to lay down and go to sleep so evenly throughout the day 
and honestly fueling your body as it's burning energy. That's why we want these carbs throughout the day. We want a good high carbohydrate start of the day. We want to make sure lunch and snacks contain it. Dinner may not be as critical if your exercise was early in the day. You can have a slightly smaller carbohydrate there. But if you're an athlete who exercises after school, you need that carbohydrate in that dinner meal. So not avoiding the carb at that time. And then this is my final slide. I wanted to give you five takeaways on why these extreme low carbohydrate, low fueling diets don't work. They're typically very low calorie. They set the body up for being in what we call negative energy balance, which is what causes the fatigue. They're lacking the essential food groups that contain core carbohydrate that you need, grains, fruits, dairy, vegetables. Sometimes you're allowed to eat vegetables on these diets, but sometimes that's also limited. So you're not meeting your major nutrient needs coming from those categories, particularly the antioxidant nutrients that are so critical for fighting disease and fighting inflammation in our body. These low carb diets lead to cravings and binging. I have a lot of women who struggle with emotional eating and they find these diets do not work for them. They are fatigued, have extreme cravings and end up overeating at night. And then these diets set the stage for becoming dehydrated, lightheaded, fatigued, cold sensitive and lowering your metabolism. And last little bullet, can increase your uh, blood lipid profile uh, when you are also eating the high protein component of these diets. All right, that is my last slide. This is just a reminder of the event you've already heard about that Saturday where we'll be putting these things into uh, real time practice. We'll have a pre-fueling snack. Abby will lead a wonderful gentle movement with us. We're gonna wear our mask and stay six feet apart. We're, we are capping it, so if you're interested, get with us quickly because we're, we're running out of space. And then I'll have a recovery snack for you as well as hydration options to have during the activity. And for questions, it would be best for me if y'all could send emails. Um, so I'm glad to answer them now or uh, afterwards via my email, which is up on this slide. So I'm glad to answer questions. and. Thanks, Abby, for having me here for this. I um, love doing these. I love spreading a fueling message and a non-diet message uh, to the public. We can't hear enough of it. So thanks for having me. Just to be respectful of everybody's time, if anybody wants to hang out after, uh, let us know. But definitely use Paige's email for further questions that's on the slide here. Again, I'm Abby Griffith with Clarity Fitness. We're so grateful to have you all here today. This was an amazing event. So thank you so, so much, Paige. Thank you so, so much, Eden. We're really excited about the rest of the, the things going on through Love Your Body Month. And we are really, really excited to bring more awareness and advocacy to body positivity and stepping away from diets, stepping away from always thinking about weight loss and not thinking about what you enjoy and quality of life. So we want to bring the attention back to the latter. Again, if anyone has anything else that they want to share, feel free. Uh, but other than that, we're signing off. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Paige. <laughs>